Hey, welcome everyone. So we'll start with a nice story today. Some of you might have heard this story of uh, King Janak. Right. So one day, I mean, it's a story, so take it as such. <laughs> one day after having a luxurious, heavy meal, um, King Janak was taking an afternoon siesta. But uh, very soon a guard comes uh, running in and uh, says, Maharaja, wake up. Uh, we are being attacked. We just spotted the enemy king approaching with a huge army. And King Janak promptly, of course, calls his generals and uh, they're all trained for this. So everyone gets instantly <clears throat> and a battle ensues. It's a fierce battle. <clears throat> The uh, heavy casualties on both sides. Let me just mute everyone. So it's a fierce battle with heavy casualties on both sides. Uh, King Janak himself gets badly injured as he fights bravely. And uh, though his army fights uh, very bravely uh, under his guidance, unfortunately they are defeated and uh, the injured king is dragged before the enemy king and uh, made to kneel down. And the enemy king tells King Janak, uh, your kingdom is now mine. As you are of royal blood, I will spare your life but now I banish you from ever stepping foot in this kingdom again. So having no choice, uh, King Janak limps his way away. He's at this point um, very weak from loss of blood, uh, quite injured, and um, he walks through the kingdom. And uh, while he was very loved by all his people when he ruled, uh, no one dares to give him even a sip of water, fearing the wrath of the new king who was known for his cruelty. So after walking for almost two full days, King Janak finally comes to the border of his kingdom and he crosses over and enters the first village of the next kingdom. There he sees uh, a line of people, a line of poor people who are waiting uh, for some food donation. So he's tired and hungry, so he joins this line of people. And finally, his turn comes, and just as his turn comes, uh, the broth, which was the gruel, which was being served, it finishes. So the, the person shows him the empty vessel and says, sorry, uh, there's nothing left. King Janak says, um, but I'm very hungry, so you can just scrape the bottom and give me what's left, you know. So the guy does that. He scrapes the bottom, all the burnt bits, the hard bits, uh, puts it into a bowl and uh, gives it to King Janak. And King Janak brings the gruel to his mouth to finally take his first sip of food in uh, two, more than two days. And just as the bowl is about to touch his lips, a kite flies back, flies by and knocks the bowl over from his hand. So the bowl spills uh, all the contents onto the dirt, onto the ground, uh, mixing with the dirt. Uh, so it's no longer eatable. And this was kind of the last straw. King Jana cannot take it anymore. He falls onto his knees wailing and prays to the Lord to take his life. And he hears a voice. It says, Maharaja, Maharaja, wake up. We heard you screaming, what's wrong? So all this was a dream, you see, a terrible nightmare. So the king wakes up at that point and realizes all that he experienced uh, just now was all a dream. And most of us at this point would have probably said, okay, 
thank God that was just a dream and uh, shaken it off and uh, gone on with life. But perhaps because the dream was so vivid or uh, also because King Janak was of a very analytical frame of mind, he couldn't, didn't shake it off, but instead wondered, kya wo such? Kya, kya, kya ye such? Was that true or is this true? And he became obsessed with this thought. That's all he kept mumbling again and again over the next few hours and days. Um, the ministers came for their, you know, getting their daily duties done, uh, concerned about him. And all he would say were, would be, kya wo such? Kya kya e such? The queen, his queen comes and all he can say is, is that true or is this true? The, at some point, uh, the queen gets concerned, the doctors are called and this is all he would say. So the word started spreading across the kingdom, some whisperings that uh, our king seems to have lost his marbles. Uh, he's just mumbling something all day long. And this uh, great sage, a jnani, an enlightened sage, Ashtavakra was traveling through the kingdom at that point. So he hears this and comes to see the king. He comes and greets the king, Maharaja, how are you? And King Janak, of course, says, kya wo such, ya ye such. So the sage Ashtavakra has some uh, special powers, so he knows what the king is talking about. And he asks, when you were kneeling in the dirt, defeated, dejected, injured, was all this wealth, your generals, your beautiful queen, was it there? King Janak says, no, I was alone. None of this was there, only defeat and depression was there. Ashtavakra asks, now that you sit in this palace on your powerful throne, surrounded by all this opulence, is that defeat, depression, all those wounds on your body, are they there now? Again, the king says, no. Ashtavakra then tells him, Maharaja, na wo such, na ye such. The question which may come to our mind now and uh, came to the king as well is that, does that mean nothing is true? And the king asked the same. And Ashtavakra says, na wo such, Na ye such, tum hi such. Neither is that true, nor is this true. Only you, the witness of both these situations, only this is the truth. Only you were there at that time when uh, this war was taking place this uh, feeling of defeat, depression, uh, all this misery was there. You were still there. And you are still there in this present moment with all this opulence and uh, grandeur and all that. So you are still there to witness this state as well in this waking state. So you, the witness, are always there. So that is what we will talk about in this class. In the last class, we finished the, the talking about the three bodies, which is one method of clearing our confusion, one prakriya it's called, of clearing the confusion. Because as we said, it's not just that I do not know who I am. I have certain notions about who I am. And... We confuse ourselves with uh, this body, this mind, and so on. So that's why we talked about the three bodies. And now we will look at the same thing from a different angle, 
we will look at it from the three states of awareness that we experience. And what are they? We will chant uh, on the end of your page nine. You can unmute yourselves. Avastha trayam kim. Avastha trayam kim. Jagrat swapna. Shushupti avastha. Shushupti avastha. The student asks, what are the threefold states of experience? And the answer simply comes, Jagrat Avastha, Swapna Avastha, and Shupti Avastha. That is the waking state, the dream state, and the deep sleep state. These are the threefold states of experience. Mm -hmm. Then on page 10, Jagrat Avastha Ka. Jagrahadhyayate Vishwa it future So the author says, Sajagratavasta, that experience is called the waking experience, Yagnayate, which is known with the help of the interaction between two factors. The sense organs, so here it says Shrotra Adi Gyanendriya. Shrotram is ears. By saying Shrotra Adi, he's referring to all the Gyanendriyas, the organs of perceptions. So it's known with the help of interaction between the sense organs and the sen sense objects, for which he says Shabda Adi Vishaya, that is the sense objects starting with sound. Uh, so we have to then add all the other sense objects which come between so it's known with the help of this interaction where i the atma identify with the stula shariram the gross body so like i said shotra adi gyanendriya means the sense organs of knowledge which are the starting with the faculty of hearing shotra and also then the faculty of uh, eyes ears nose tongue and skin so not the physical part, of course, which we know as Golakam, but the power behind this, which are known as Indriyas. So I hope you remember this distinction from our earlier classes. And Shabda Adi Vishya, Shabda Adi just means etc. So Shabda is sound. So the sense objects starting with sound, so which also means um, the rest of sight, touch, taste, and um, what's left, a smell, right? So the sense organs cannot generate any experience by themselves. And experience is generated when they come in contact with the sense objects, right? So ears generate an experience of hearing when they come in contact with sound, shabda. Eyes generate an experience of sight when they come in contact with form and color, rupa. A nose uh, or the indrium of nose, when it comes in contact with the world of smells, it uh, generates ganda, which means both pleasurable or uh, you know unpleasant smells. And when the indrium of tongue comes in contact with uh, rasa, taste, is generated, the experience of taste is generation. 
And then when the indrium of skin comes in contact with the objects of uh, sparsha, touch, the experience of this is generated. So the first principle for the generation of any experience is that a healthy indriyam must come in contact with the sense objects. So in the waking state, this experience generated by interaction between the sense organs and the external sense objects um, versus in the dream state that uh, experience is generated not from actual live interaction, but uh, because there are no external sense objects in our dream state, but from a recorded experience that we'll come to later. So the external sense objects themselves are available only in the waking state. So right now in this class, you're able to see me on the screen and hear me because your sense organs are coming in contact with the image and sound from the screen, right? So if you have uh, dozed off or gotten distracted, then that too, that experience of this class is no longer generated because one of the two factors required are not there. The sense organs are not available for the interaction. So each of these, interactions based on our own preferences will cause pleasure or pain. So the same experience could generate uh, pleasure for one person and pain for one person. So if uh, some of you have teenagers in the house, um, they might like to play very loud music, uh, which is very pleasurable for them but it might be the same music might be causing you pain. <laughs> so that this, the experience which is generated based on our, uh, what we call raga dvesha, our likes and dislikes, binding likes and dislikes. So the problem with painful experiences, of course, we understand. And what is the problem with pleasurable experiences? Does anyone remember? What's the problem with Vishayananda? Dukkhamishrita. Atripti karatvam. And the third one? Bandhakatvam. Excellent. Right. So there is a problem with pleasurable experiences also that we've seen. So because of attachment, pandakatvam, there is a desire for more of the same experience. Whenever desire, kama, is fulfilled, there is usually greed. And whenever kama is not fulfilled, it leads to anger and uh, sadness or delusion, right? which may lead one to then act in an adharmic way. On the onset, it would seem like all our emotional problems uh, come because of this interaction between the sense organs and sense objects. Actually, a lot of different philosophies uh, other than Advaita Vedanta will say that the problem occurs because of this interaction. So what is the solution? Do we want to go through life without having any experiences. Certain philosophies will say, whatever experience comes, uh, you just act with equanimity, do not uh, react to any of these experiences. And slowly you can get rid of these vasanas one by one. We disagree because these vasanas are infinite. And even the vasanas which are available to you uh, which make themselves available to you uh, through introspection or when situations arise, they are limited to what you've been given in this lifetime. Right? We remember that there is a Karana Shariram which will generate multiple births. Each of those births is uh, determined by karma. So you will have a 
different set of vasanas. So no matter how much with equanimity you do not react, um, you cannot get rid of all your vasanas. So the problem is not just this interaction which is causing. You can also choose to not have any interaction if you had the option to be completely pain-free life uh, to with, by being induced in a coma. Would any of you take it? I assume not, right? Because we all have also have an innate desire to be conscious. Absolute consciousness is our essential nature. And this is not something we will give up. So Satchitananda, absolute existence, consciousness, bliss, this is our essential nature and we will not want to give that up. So on analyzing further, we realize that our emotional problems are not merely because of this interaction, but because of the craving which is generated from this interaction. And why is this craving generated? The craving for more, because we do not realize that we are already complete. Purnaha. The solution for removing the pain lies in removing the craving. And how do we remove the craving? By realizing that I am complete, by realizing my true nature as this fullness. That's the only thing which will make me not crave anything anymore. Because when I am fullness, I will realize that there is nothing outside me to crave. And if this realization can happen, then when a beautiful, pleasurable experience come, I will enjoy it, knowing fully well that my ananda nature is simply being reflected in this object that I'm enjoying. My happiness is not actually dependent on this object. Hence, if the object goes away, there is no sorrow. Similarly, if a painful experience comes, which is painful because of my dvesha, my aversion to that experience, I can simply tap into my UPS, if you remember the acronym, my unlimited pleasure supply, my Atma Ananda. So a lot of our spiritual practice initially is about removing these cravings and aversions that we call Raga Dvesha, which is binding likes and dislikes. So our pursuit, our spiritual pursuit, a lot of it is about converting these binding likes and dislikes to mere preferences. Because likes and dislikes will always be there. And there is nothing wrong with that. If you put a, um, two ice creams in front of a gyani, one chocolate and uh, one strawberry, even the gyani, the enlightened person, will have a preference and he will pick one, right? But uh, he's just not going to be upset if his favorite chocolate is not there. So it's about converting, bind, making these binding likes and dislikes non-binding. So we said that the first principle of generation of an experience is that a healthy indriyam must come in contact with a sense object. So, and the second principle is that for the interaction to happen, it must have our backing. If you're not able to hear something well, you will turn your ear in that direction, right? Or um, so you will strain to hear by kind of doing that. Or if you can't uh, see something well, you will strain your eyes to try to see this better. So that means I'm giving my backing. So these are, of course, exaggerated actions, but we're always this giving our backing to the indriyams. For this backing, what we're basically talking about is I'm identifying with these physical parts, the golakams. 
the, so there is a Golakam Abhimana. There, uh, I, there is an identification with the Golakams, right? So every Golakam is part of the physical body. And hence, this requires an identification with the physical body. This is Sharira Abhimana. Additionally, just the Golakam being present is not enough. The Indriyam must also have my backing. So, and the Indriyam belongs to, the, when we say the Indriyam must have my backing, that means the mind must be present. And I must identify with the sense organ. This is called Indriya Abhimana. Without identifying with the body, I cannot operate the sense organs and I cannot experience the external world, which is why uh, this in the next line of this text, it says, Stula Sharira Abhimani, Atma Vishwa Itiuchate. So this means uh, when the conscious being I identify with the physical body, I am called, he's given a name for this personality. It's called Vishwa, which means the waker. Uh, so while the author specifically mentions only the physical body, in the case of Vishwa, we have to take, we, it, he also identifies with the other two bodies, with the Sukshma Shariram and the Karana Shariram, because we said the there must also be a backing of the with my mind, right? So which belongs to the sukshma sharidam, I hope you remember. So, but when uh, there is sleep or dream state, when our body is not there, there is no abhimana, there is no identification with the physical body itself in our dream state. So this identification is not there in the other states. And uh, so because this identification is not there, we cannot generate any experience. Uh, if you might, if you're in deep sleep, a mosquito may be biting you or a neighbors next door may be having a very loud fight, but you will have no identification with these body. So with the Golakams and the Indriyam. So these things will not uh, disturb you. Uh, you are temporarily at least a Jeevan Mukta at that point. Right. So, in the waking state, I'm the Stula Sharira Abhimani, experiencing the external world, and I'm called Vishwa, the waker. In the dream, I don't identify with the body, and hence don't experience the external world. So, we'll talk about the mechanics of how the dream state is experienced shortly. So, any questions in the meantime? That brings us to the conclusion of introduction of the three states and also the waking state experience. Am I going too fast? It's okay. You're good. Let's respond then. Sorry, Mahalakshmi, you had a question? It's, it's quite clear. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next part. We will chant. Swapna vasta teti chet. Swapna vasta teti chet. Jagratta vasta yam. Jagratta vasta yam. Yadrishtam Yachutam Yadrishtam Yachutam Tajanita Vasanayam Tajanita Vasanayam Nidra Samaye Nidra Samaye Yaf Prapanchay Yaf Prapanch Yaf Pratiyate Yaha Prabhupada Vasta Sukshma Sharira Bimani 
Right, so the student asks, what is Swapnavasta, the dream state? And um, the answer comes, Jagrat Avastayam, in the waking state, Yad Drishtam, what is seen? Yat Shrutam, what was heard? Tad Janati, sorry, what does it say? Tad Janati Vashaya, projected by the impressions born of that. Nidra Samaye, while in sleep. Yaf, yaf Prapancha, which world? Pratiyate is experienced. Saswapna Avastha, that is the dream state. So in the waking state, what is seen, what was heard, uh, the impressions born out of these experiences are projected while in sleep. And this is called the dream state. The Sukshma Sharira Abhimani Atma, I Atma, identifying with the Sukshma Sharira, the subtle body. Tejasaha, the if iti uchyate, I am called Tejasa. Tejasa is the effulgent one. So if asked what is the dream state, in summary, this world which is experienced while in sleep, projected by the impressions born of what was seen, what was heard in the waking state, I, Atma, identifying with the subtle body, am called Tejasa, the effulgent one. So the teacher first talks about the mechanism of the dream state. In the waking state, along with having all these experiences, the mind also records these experiences. It is more sophisticated than any recorder in, ex uh, in existence because it records not just the sound and images, but also taste, smell, and touch. Additionally, it even records and registers the emotions, the anger we feel, the happiness, worry, jealousy, and all these uh, emotions are stored as impressions. More powerful the experience, the deeper the impression. And this recorder, is this very incredible recorder records experiences across lifetimes. So we remember that the mind belongs to the sukshma sheridam. So we may not, uh, so some of the things which we, uh, you know, recall or know, it might not even belong to this lifetime. We may not recall them actively uh, because of the long passage of time, because there's so many things, even from this lifetime, uh, from when we were younger, we don't recall, right? But these impressions are there. And Shastra uh, calls them uh, vasanas or samskaras. So we, I mentioned it a couple of times before, but it's kind of officially being introduced here now. So make a note of that. So vasanas are impressions um, which uh, from this lifetime or past lifetimes, which become your personality traits, right? So to understand this, we can think of, um, there's so many um, examples for this. Let's think of, child prodigies. There are some kids who are born with uh, some exceptional talent, like um, Mithuvan was uh, playing and composing at the age of five, right? There are uh, certain kids there um, who are math geniuses, even someone known to me um, when this child, when he was four years old, you, give, you could give him any uh, date in the future and he would say which day of the week it was 
and uh, no one had taught him this. He simply figured this out because one of his uh, favorite car magazines came every Wednesday. So he wanted to figure out, um, and when he went to, he asked his dad, when is the next magazine coming? Um, he was given a date. So he did this calculation by himself and figured it out. So how do we explain things like this? This can only be because of past uh, vasanas, which belong to a different lifetime. So in the waking state, all these impressions are stored, which make up the vasanas. But when the body needs rest and we go to sleep, the player takes over. So the recording function stops, but the player function of the mind takes over. And the same vasanas, which were recorded, will be projected out. This we call the dream universe, the Swapna Prapancha. So Jagrat Avastayam Yad Drishtam Yad Shrutam. What is heard and what is seen in the waking state? And we will, of course, add all these other things like smell, touch, taste, etc. This produces the vasana. Tat Janati Vasanaya. That uh, means born out of these experiences is the vasana. Nidra Samaye. At the time of sleep, yah prapancha pratyate, that inner private world, that the mentally generated world is projected and experienced. And this is called the dream state. So there is nothing new whichever comes up in our uh, dream state. It is all born out of our impressions, of course. The player also sometimes jumble things up. So it will take impressions from different scenarios and it seems to create this wonderful new story. Uh, but it's all, the whole dream world is born out of our own impressions. Right, of course, today we might, um, you know, sometimes if you have these kind of uh, very fantasy sort of dreams, um, we can't conclude that this must belong to some past lifetime and all because there is so much uh, TV, et cetera, that we watch. So if you're having some experience in your dream, which you have no recollection of doing in your life, it could also be from these other impressions that we had, right? So, right, so continuing. This, um, for the dreamer, we know that the dream world is completely real. When you are in that dream state, right, just like in the story of King Janak that we started with, um, you don't realize that you're having a dream. So whatever experiences come, again, based on our vasanas, they have a Tendons, they will have the ability to cause you suffering or to cause you pleasure. So if you're attached to your money and in the dream you have a you, are, you have a dream of losing all your money, this will cause suffering. A lot of our own fears are projected in the dream. So that dream world we create becomes completely real for the dreamer you realize it that it's a dream only on waking up. So Vedanta says that this waking state is again like another dream, created uh, this another dream where I created this universe and I myself am appearing as this Jiva because of uh, the wailing power of Maya. And this truth will become clear only at the time of moksha. This is when it will become completely clear, where I will wake up in my dream and I can understand that uh, this body and mind are not me and I'm playing a part. And that's when life becomes a leela, it becomes a play, an enjoyable play. Because whatever happens, 
has no capacity any longer to cause you suffering. So for Swapna Vasta, the Vasana Abhimana is required. And Vasana belongs to the mind, the Sukshma Sharira. Hence, in the dream state, it is said that I'm identifying with the Sukshma Sharira. So, and they've, we've given a name for this personality called Tejasa. And uh, Tejasa, it originates, this word originates, um, originating from or consisting of light, it also means. And why is it called Tejasa? Because in uh, waking up, when the, we experience the external world, we use a different light for these experiences. But in the dream state, where is the light coming from that is illumining these experiences? It is from Swayam Jyoti. It's from my own light. That is why the dreamer is called Tejasa. Right, so any questions on the dream state? Uh, Spandana ji, uh, like I have experienced some uh, sometimes that uh, like when I'm in a dream, at maybe towards the end of the dream, I realize that it's a dream, but even then it's difficult for me to come out of that state. And mm -hmm. I'm just lying there and, you know, experiencing that again, but I'm still sort of aware somewhere that it is not the actual reality. Right. So, like, how does that happen? It's kind of the... Um, so, we're not talking about it in these verses specifically, but that is more likely, and you know, the in-between state, you would have come awake, you've become awake, so you're aware it was a dream, and then sometimes it's a nice dream, so we try to go back to sleep and continue that dreaming, so you're kind of switching between waking and dreaming state. That's the only okay. thing you right now. There are some and other philosophies which talk about lucid dreaming and things like that, but honestly, they don't, that doesn't address that. I don't know if there is some reference somewhere, but uh, it doesn't. Vedanta doesn't specifically address that, uh, as far as my my knowledge goes. Yes, Mahalakshmi. Uh, let's say when we when we are in dream state, we are. Uh, there's a certain state we are in and there's a person sleeping beside us. He's also dreaming. So mm -hmm. are we in the same, are we sharing the same space or is that space very individualized for each person? The uh, dream state. No, it's completely individual because the dream state is um, generated from your own mind. Right. So, Bandana ji, I had a question. Uh, just one, I want to add one more thing to Mahalakshmi's thing. But of course, it's possible that, you know, if there is someone sleeping next to you, just before the dream started, when you were still in the waking state, maybe there are more impressions which got registered from that person next to you, right? Maybe from their smell or even their energy, we can sense people's energies, right? We can, we do get affected by people's energies. We've all experienced how if um, we have, uh, we are in the company of uh, very happy people, we feel happy ourselves. If we are in the company of uh, someone who's very angry or sad, we do, even if they haven't said anything, they're just sitting there silently, we do get affected by that energy. So while mm -hmm. they can't come to you they kind of back to you in your dream once you've fallen asleep and having your dream because then your sense organs uh, your indriyams are no longer available to you to register new things but before you fell asleep uh, before you know you went into the dream state you could still be registering impressions from this person and that can impact you which is why we have to be very careful about the people we surround ourselves with, the company we keep, one, uh, and I know it's not always possible, we can't always control all the situations, but as far as possible, 
we should try to enjoy some satsanga, uh, company of fellow spiritual aspirants, because this will be conducive. Yes, uh, Sri Lata, I think you had a question. Yeah, Spandaraji, uh, I was about to ask, why do we experience the sleep paralysis? Pardon me? Uh, we sometimes we experience uh, the sleep paralysis, now. Sleep? Why do that? Paralysis. Uh, that, we, means, that means we are experiencing uh, everything uh, like real, but we can't move or we can't uh, even open our eyes. Mm, okay, like that, like sleepwalking and things like that. Yeah. Honestly, I, I don't have a Vedantic explanation for that. Uh, it's out of the scope of my expertise. So maybe one of some of one of the doctors here uh, can give us the medical view, and I can I can check uh, based on their explanation. I can try to check if there's Vedantic correlation I can make. Okay. Um, any doctors here want to volunteer an answer? <laughs> we won't be able to include that in our scope of discussion then at this point. Oh, okay, thank you, Sandanaji. Right. So let's do the last state, end of your page 10. You can unmute yourself. Ata shushupti avastha kam. Ata shushupti avastha Aham kimapi na jana mi. Aham kimapi na jana mi. Suke na maya. Suke na maya. Nidra nu buyat. Nidra nu buyat. Iti shushupti avastha. Iti shushupti avastha. Karana sharira bimani. Karana sharira bimani. Atma pragnya itu chate. Atma pragnya itu chate. Thank you. So the author says, Tataha then, Shushupti Avastha, the deep sleep state is what? And the answer comes, Aham, I, Kimapi, Najanami, I do not know anything. Sukena, happily, Maya, this is not Maya, by me. Nidra Anubuyate, sleep is experienced. Iti shushupti avastha. This is the deep sleep state. Summary. I do not know anything. Happily, the sleep is experienced by me. This is the deep sleep state. Next, he says, I, Atma, identifying with the causal body, am called pragna. Pragna. Uh, right. So it's important to know pragna. Um, actually, I'm not no Sanskrit expert, but I will come back to you with the yeah, like the exact. Uh, so when you say pra, uh, pragna, pragna, it means um, this uh, the deep sleeper. Or it also means the illumined one in another sense. And there is another slightly different pronunciation, which means um, not illumined, but it means completely um, uh, com com completely ignorant. <laughs> so there is a very slight pronunciation difference. I'll have to I'll just clarify that and come back to you. So in the sleep state, there is neither an external world and uh, 
that is seen through the sense organs, nor is there an inner world projected due to the vasanas. So the state of total non-experience in deep sleep, uh, but this by itself is kind of an experience, no? Because the author says, aham kimapi na janami, I do not know anything. So there is this still this experience of not knowing anything. Um, because when we become awake, then we say, I slept like a log, I slept so well. I'm aware of the fact that I'm not aware of anything. This experience is getting registered, hence I'm able to talk about it on waking up. So people often say I was dead to the world, right? So we do not experience either the internal world or external world. There is no interactions either. So there is no reactions. There is no emotions, no worries. All these belong to the mind. And the mind is also resolved in the deep sleep state. So there is no pain of the body being experienced. Uh, if you're in a completely deep sleep slate, someone could be slapping you and you won't feel that pain. And whether it's a beggar who goes to sleep or a millionaire, there is no difference in their state of deep sleep. So this, there is a nirvikalpa. There is a state of no differences. We experience nothing except deep relaxation. This experience is called sukha jnana anubhava. So two experiences are there. That of total peace, ananda, and ignorance of everything. So the individual is still said to be there because I slept or I am feeling no experience is registered. But the individuality is gone. And the experience is a happy one. Why? Because there is no vikalpa, no differences. There is no duality. And uh, when there is no other... There is nothing to fear. There is also nothing to crave. So nirvikalpa is always a state of happiness, of bliss, because of these no differences. And that is why people often love sleep so much. They want to extend that sleep. This is also why people love nirvikalpa ka samadhi. So because... Uh, and of course, there is a difference between deep sleep and nirvikalpaka samadhi state because uh, the mind is not resolved in samadhi. The mind is still, uh, there is still awareness. So, but the, in terms of there being no divisions, both are the same. So this experience of ignorance is registered by the dormant mind and the, the resolved mind is basically what? It's the karana shariram, right? So we spoke of um, how the seed form is called karana shariram. So it's, that's what is being identified with here. As the mind is resolved, the time of this experience, um, at the time of that uh, experience, you cannot, again, like same as in the dream state, you cannot say, I am experiencing sleep. It's only on waking up, you can talk about that experience. Uh, and why is it that while sleeping, I cannot, uh, you know, claim this? One, because there is no mind. The other, because there is no experience, uh, experience duality also. So who will claim, right? So therefore, the Abhimanam is with the causal body in the deep sleep state. Right. So the author gives the technical name Pragnya to a person in this Sushupti Avastha. And so the waking state is experienced when I identify with the gross body and by extension, the Sukshma and the Karna Shariram also. So the Stula Sharira Abhimani, the waker is called Vishwa. And the dream steep, uh, state is um, 
when I identify with the sukshma sharidam, the dreamer is called tejasa. And in the deep sleep state, when one identifies with the causal body, the karana shariram, the sleeper is called pragna. So by saying, I, the atma, in all these three, if you have noticed, the author is hinting at the fact that there is a mistaken notion being propagated here. That I, the atma, am mistakenly thinking that I am this waker or the dreamer or the deep sleep personality. These are merely upadis, limiting adjuncts which uh, upadi is something which seems to bring about a change in something, which a change which is not actually there. If you put, um, if you take a crystal, a very clear crystal, and you put some, uh, like a rose behind the crystal, right? The crystal will appear to be red. We can try it ourselves right now. So, I mean, now you know that it's not complete illusion, but if you can't, if you couldn't completely see, right, this glass appears uh, blue, correct? This water in the glass could appear blue if I was doing a better job of doing this illusion, right? But if I remove it, you can see that it's clear. So that is an upadi. In this case, this cloth was an upadi, a limiting adjunct, which was making you see a difference which was not actually there. So similarly, our body is an upadi. Our mind is an upadi, which are creating limitations in our perception that don't actually exist because I am actually unlimited. You are unlimited. So. In conclusion, the Atma is not really any of these. It's not the waker, it's not the dreamer, it's not the deep sleep personality. It is beyond. In other words, it's also called Turya, the fourth. So the fourth is not a fourth state because it's not something you will come out of. The fourth is the witness of all these three states. And uh, it is the witness which is present in all these three states. That's what um, Ashwakra meant in that story when he said, neither is that true, neither is this true, only you are the truth. And how do we find this truth? By inquiring into these different experiences. Uh, not a self-inquiry, but the kind of inquiry you're doing right now inquiring with the help of the Shastra and the teacher. And the phalam, the fruit of this inquiry is knowing Atma, knowing myself. So a, any given method of an inquiry is called a prakriya. So the three states of awareness is one prakriya that we use in Vedanta, just like the three bodies example. So when we Go back to the crystal example. By watching the crystal in these different situations, we can notice the unchanging nature of the crystal itself. So the crystal does not change its color to red because a red rose is put behind it. Right? Um, it simply appears differently because of that body. The crystal's purity is not changing. And so too, it is with Atman. It's, it can appear in many different ways, but the essence is always the same. So I am Vishwa, Tejasa, or Pragna, depending on which standpoint one considers, just like I am a, a daughter, a sadhaka, a friend, a teacher, depending on which role I identify with. Right. So this is something we must inquire into by ourselves further now. So that we can conclude the class here and take any questions if there are any. 
I have a question, mm-hmm. please. Yes, please go ahead, Veer Ji. Uh, when you uh, spoke about uh, the proper way of learning, uh, being with the teacher, just now, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I can't refer to it in Sanskrit though, with antic terms. I was just wondering, um, the uh, conditioning of the teacher would also be affecting the conditioning of the student, like you know, the teacher him or herself would also be imposing his or her journey on the manner of teaching to the student so that could be an impediment um, to actually say perhaps a person coming into a state of turiya or into a state of moksha because the teacher is himself or herself is imposing certain thoughts and certain patterns uh, you know vedana or whatever you know into the Mm-hmm. mind of the student so i was just wondering how uh, that would affect the uh, journey of a pupil or of a, a sadhak right. thank you so for sure it's um, in so if you have done ttc would have seen um, the different kinds of teachers also right uh, in uh, i mean you, you might not have done ttc but they'll talk about a tamasic teacher and a rajasic teacher and so on so for sure a teacher someone picks can be will have a huge impact on your journey um what shastra mm. says the guidance is that the teacher it's said many times in the shastra that the ideal teacher is i mean the first condition is non negotiable should be a shotriya which means they must have had a teacher which means they must belong to a lineage because in this lineage we say that that's why we don't we specifically ask no one to use the term guru or anything even our head teach acharya ravi ji no one none of us call him guru we call him acharya because we say the only guru is the teaching itself you know so any shotriya teacher a teacher belonging to the lineage will speak the same thing so you can try watch some videos of uh, ravi ji aracha maya acharya or you can watch some uh, videos of uh, swami parmarthananda i think some of his audios might be available you will find that we will you won't find any contradiction in what any of us is saying we will of course all have our own style because based on our experience in life giving the kind of examples we might refer to and all that uh, but uh, i don't know if this lady is there in class today no actually just the other day oh, no i think she's not in this class so just the other day actually one lady was asking me what is this book that all of you refer to because she had attended tatva bodha four times and she said with different teachers of our lineage and she said all of you say the exact same thing you know that's the that's the sampradaya so because we've all learned through this lineage we will all speak uh, we will all be speaking of the same knowledge and there will be you won't find any contradictions in the knowledge of course that's what should be ideally so that's the power of the sampradaya uh will you find certain teachers sometimes who teach and are not uh, completely aligned with this yes i guess it could happen uh, but typically none of us teaches till uh, actually none of us came forward ourselves and said we will teach it happened because our teacher said it's time for you to now teach <laughs> so but can yes, i add something oh. yeah i'll just finish so you should definitely as per shastra run far away from anyone who claims i do not have a teacher i learned myself you know that's uh, even if it's an enlightened person um like it's uh, for example ramana maharishi so we're not sure if there is no known teacher of his that we know of that he had in this lifetime but we all accept him as an enlightened person but you will often find that uh, i mean ramana maharishi is there on my altar also so i hope 
no one will misunderstand what I'm saying. So we believe him to be an enlightened person. There's a lot of his texts we study. But if you read his direct teachings, it would be a bit hard to understand completely. It's typically best to study a Ramana Maharishi text with the help of a Shotriya teacher. Right. So they say only a Shotriya teacher should teach and the other is in an ideal situation is a Jnana Nishta, which is uh, they should also be fully, they should also be realized. But uh, whether you get a completely Brahma Nishta teacher, like I was told, depends on one's own karma. That's the ideal teacher, but any teacher in the Sampradaya will will have this firm conviction. They would have at least finished the Stavaram stage and they will have this firm conviction that I do believe in this truth that I'm talking about. You know, there are certain personalities, traits, which might still come up. Uh, he might also be subject to fits of, uh, you know, disturbances and so on, which is the job of the third stage, the Nididhyasanam, to remove. Right. So, uh, uh, I want to add something here. Uh, I think when we when we say this prayer in the beginning of the session all the time, Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, that is actually a prayer to facilitate the transfer of knowledge from Guru to the Shisha, as I understand. Absolutely. And especially the last line, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavid Vishavavayehi, that actually means that there should be no dispute between the minds of the teacher and the student. Absolutely. <laughs> which means the transmission is smooth and the knowledge is transferred perfectly. I think so that is uh, probably the way to go mm -hmm. that you say the prayer and uh, the transfer should happen. Mm. Uh, and everyone has to also, so we talk about Shraddha, right? In, uh, in the qualifications, we talked about Shraddha in both the words of the Shastra as well as the words of the teacher. So this knowledge will not really work for you if you cannot have Shraddha in the teacher you've picked. So, and like we keep saying, it should not be blind faith, right? Because you are, your intellect must be satisfied. So all of you are here either probably because, you know, someone else um, from the Sangha told you it, it worked for them. And you will see for yourself, I'm assuming based on how the Tattva Bodha goes, uh, you will decide, you know, whether you, if you're new to the Sangha, you will decide, you know, if you want to continue studying and such. So that can only happen if you manage to have some faith in the whole thing. And so you, you will also be guided in this through your inner guru. So, because when we say Shastra is the guru, uh, all these teachers who come along the way are containers who are for pouring that knowledge and they will keep pouring that knowledge till such time your inner guru can be completely awakened. That's a good question. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, so, Swandhanaji, we were talking about these three states of awareness. So, uh, just want to understand that uh, is there something which is mentioned in the Shasanas that maybe as a person become like walks further in their spiritual journey or a person like who's already enlightened? Like, the, is there like a change in how they experience these three states or do they experience less of the dream state and more of the deep sleep, sleep state or something like that, which is mentioned? Oh, uh, I mean, it's probably mentioned somewhere, um, uh, but yeah, not, not specifically something I've come across, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's commonly of course said, so your, why do we go to sleep? Because your body needs rest, right? So a lot of people also can experience a um, uh, very high state of restfulness by meditating. So for, by meditating, 
longer you, your body might feel less need for sleep. So you might sleep less. So those things can happen. Is that kind of what you mean? Um, no, like especially between the dream state versus deep sleep. Um, no, not, not nothing specifically. I mean, in general, it's like I mean, it's understood more in the yogic way that uh, the more you meditate, there might be less need for sleep, so you might spend less time sleeping. But there is okay. none of this will impact whether or not um, one will get liberated or <laughs> anything like that. Yes, yes, because I I feel like I have experience. So, for example, uh, even today or uh, today today's sleep like it was sort of like a lot of dreamy sleep like where I was you know experiencing multiple dreams so then when I wake up it's not as relaxing as compared to the other nights when mm -hmm. we are probably in a deep sleep state right yeah for sure it's um, the deep sleep where is the majority of the rest comes in that's what uh, even the doctors will tell you and uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of not really Vedanta, but uh, uh, you can take care of that by, with again, like we said, is the impressions which are coming back, uh, your recorded impressions which are coming back in your sleep, right? And those impressions, especially just the couple of hours before you sleep, will be more prominent. Right. So you can take care of those impressions, which of um, all electronics and such for a couple of hours before you sleep, um, go into a more relaxed, um, quieter withdrawal mode, and that generally helps people have better sleep. Got it. Thank you. Right. No more questions. We can end with the ending prayers. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnad Purnamudachate Mudachate Purnasama Purnameva Vashishate Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Yom Shri Guru um, that's it. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Thank you, Swandanaji. Thank you, Swandanaji. Thank you. Thank you.